Hey guys, how's it going? Keegan here on a Wednesday night for our Wednesday night youth group. I am so glad that you are joining us again for another night of reading through and going through the story of Joseph together in the book of Genesis. I am so glad that you're here with us today. Well, I would love to be meeting again in face-to-face, person-to-person. This is what we are continuing to do so we can continue to faithfully go through God's Word together. So before we start, before I uh, start teaching today through uh, Genesis 39 and 40, I do have just a couple of announcements for you. First and foremost, don't forget that since we started today at 6 instead of 6.30, just like every week, Zoom will start, your small groups will start right after this, and We made that so your small groups will be done no later than 8 o'clock. That way, once we're done here, you can go right over to our Facebook or YouTube page, our Compass Bible Treasure Valley page, and start watching with your family, as we would love for you to do that, tonight's time in worship and as Pastor Ben's going to teach through another psalm. That's why we started early, and don't worry. We will be done no later than 8 o'clock tonight. Second reminder is don't miss out on Pastor Ben's study tonight as we are going through another psalm and worshiping together. This is a great time for you to spend time with your family, glorifying God and learning about God's word. And finally, don't forget that this Friday, just like last Friday, we have our weekly Plants and Pillars prayer night starting at 7 going to 7.30. Last week we had 20 people, which was awesome. 20 of you guys spending time with us praying about everything going on, whether it's the coronavirus or things your family need prayer for or things you need prayer for. It was a great time for us to spend time over Zoom praying together. So don't forget that is happening again this week at 7 o'clock to 7.30, just 30 minutes of your time. Definitely, uh, if you're able to make it, I would love for you to be there. Um, But let's start tonight by going through, again, continuing through the story of Joseph by spending some time in prayer. Father God, we thank you for another Wednesday come, Lord, that we are able to glorify you, God, that we're able to learn from your word, God, that we are able to go over the story of Joseph, Lord, and to have hope in your ultimate plan. Lord, we pray tonight that you would allow us to take good notes, that you would allow us to pay attention, Father God, to put aside all the distractions as we are home and on our phones or on our couches, that we would put aside all the distractions and get ready to read from your word and then discuss it in small groups, Lord. We pray now that you would be glorified in everything we do, Father. In your name we pray, amen. And yeah, absolutely, do not forget, if you're looking for the notes, if you're looking for discussion questions, they are in the description below here in this YouTube video on our page right here. So click on those links, find those, they're there for you. We've also emailed them out. That way you can take good notes and be ready to have some good discussion right after this. But without further ado, let's get started. And as we get started today, we'll be starting in Genesis 39, going through verse 21 and going all the way through chapter 40. So we'll be starting in Genesis 39, verse 21. But as you open up your Bibles, as you open up your Bible to Genesis 39, 21, I do have a question for you today. As you've probably seen, today's, today's message is titled, The Waiting Game. The Waiting Game. Us playing the waiting game. And my question for you today is, have you ever had to play the waiting game? game before? Was there something going on and you had no impact on the in, the outcome, the initial outcome, what was eventually going to happen? So all you could do was wait. Have you ever been in a situation like that where you can't affect the outcome of a situation and all you can do is sit there and wait for whatever is going to happen to happen? My, my question for you is, how did you feel? How did you feel in that time? Were you anxious? Were you nervous? Were you scared? Were you angry? Did you try to force your plan onto whatever situation it was, trying to make what you wanted to happen happen? Did you try to manufacture a run, trying to make what you wanted come to fruition? What did you do? How did you feel? What were you personally sitting there on your couch feeling? Nervous, anxious, scared, all of the above? Maybe something different? How did you feel? 
And as I think about playing the waiting game, kind of at your age, I remember having to play the waiting game, what it felt like every single week in Spanish class. I definitely played the waiting game because every week we would take a test. And just in case you were wondering, I, Keegan, was not good at Spanish. I know you're shocked. I know that comes to a shock to all of you, but I was not great at Spanish. And it's not because I didn't try and it's not because I didn't care. It's just because I struggled at it. I wasn't great. It didn't matter how much I studied, how much time I put in. At the end of the day, when I got to class to take a test or a quiz, I would just blank. I would forget everything I studied and have to nervously answer all the questions for each test. And every week I would just turn in this test, anxiously wondering if half the answers I wrote were correct or if I had just blanked on the whole test and if I was going to fail out of Spanish. And I remember every time I would turn in that test and walk away and leave class, I was left playing the waiting game, waiting to see if three days from now, since you would normally take a test on Friday and you would find out the answer on Monday, the grade, if over that weekend I was left thinking, how did I do? Did I fail? Is my dream of getting a decent grade in Spanish done? Did I completely bomb this entire test? How did I do? And I had to wait the entire weekend to see that eventual answer that was coming on Monday of did I pass? Did I get an A, a B, a C? What did I get? Did I fail? I had to play the waiting game. And it wasn't fun. It wasn't fun at all. The, those few days of waiting every single week definitely took a toll on me and there was nothing that I could do, right? I had already put in the work studying, I had already taken the test, there wasn't anything that I, Keegan, could personally do to make that test get back to me faster or to change the answers to be correct afterwards. I couldn't make myself get a better grade after I had taken the test and I had to just sit there and wait over the weekend. I had to play the waiting game. I, I usually, I mean, just uh, kind of thinking out loud, I usually finished with eh, sort of kind of in that B range. So I didn't fail the class, but it definitely wasn't my strong suit. And I just, I remember that I had to play the waiting game every single week. And I remember feeling those same things that I mentioned earlier, nervousness, anxiousness, confusion, all of those things, scared, not knowing what was going to happen, if I was going to fail or if I was going to pass. I remember feeling those things every single week. But obviously, you know and I know, we have to play the waiting game for a lot of things that are much more serious than trivial things like a Spanish test in high school. That there are things that happen in your and my life that are a lot more important and there's a lot more at stake than just how did I do on this test. That there are more serious things going on. And even right now, we can take that and apply that to our lives as an example. Right now, we're all facing this coronavirus thing. We don't know when we're gonna get to be able to go back outside or to spend quality time less than six feet away from good friends or family or when we're gonna be able to all buy toilet paper again or whatever it is, we don't know when that's going to happen. And we're all stuck right now at our houses, practicing social distancing and playing the waiting game. And I'm sure you can say, just like I can say, it's not a fun game to play, right? It's not super fun right now for all of us to be playing the waiting game together. And, and I'm sure just like me, you're feeling those same, same things. Nervousness, anxiousness, being scared, wondering what's going to happen, and not knowing how this is going to be, resol to be resolved. And I mean, we can absolutely guarantee that we are going to, you and I are going to face things, whether big like this, or things that are bigger, or small things that are just daily occurrences that cause us to play the waiting game. And the question you're going to have to answer in those times, in those times of playing the waiting game, not knowing how something's going to be resolved, you're going to have to give the answer to the question, who or what 
do I trust? Who do you trust? What do you trust when you are forced to play the waiting game? Am I going to try to trust in the plan that I've made, in the things that I want to happen, in what I want to see happen in my life? Am I going to trust in that, that that's going to come to fruition? Or am I going to trust in God's plan no matter how long it takes? No matter what happens, no matter how low or high things seem to be, what am I going to trust? What are you going to trust during the waiting game? And as we, as we continue today through the story of Joseph, through the accounts of what happened in the life of Joseph, we're going to see that sometimes the waiting game means waiting a little more than just a few days to get your Spanish test back or waiting more than just a few months for us to flatten the curve of the coronavirus. We're going to see that for Joseph, sometimes the waiting game meant I had to wait years, two years. We're going to see that Joseph has to wait in prison for crimes that he didn't even commit. That we're going to see that sometimes the waiting game takes a little longer than a few days or a few months. But we're going to see that even though sometimes we have to wait to realize and see God's plan to come to fruition, that doesn't mean that God's plan isn't still at work. So if you have your Bibles, which are at your house, I make this joke every week, but you're at your house, you should have a Bible in your house or on your phone. I'd love for you to turn with me to Genesis 39, starting in verse 21. And as you turn there, I just would love to recap as you're turning there to Genesis 39, chapter 21, over what's going on and what has happened in the life of Joseph. So we've seen so far that his brothers hate him, that he's had these dreams and it makes his brothers hate him even more, that they throw him in a pit and they're trying to decide if they're going to kill him. And instead of killing him, they sell him into slavery. He goes to Egypt. He's sold to Potiphar. He's then accused of crimes he didn't commit. And then he's thrown into jail for these things that he hasn't done. That's what's happened so far in the story of Joseph. That's the short version of what has happened to Joseph so far. That way we don't spend all of our time recapping over what things that we've gone over so far, but we can focus on what's happening today, what's happening in what we're reading today. And and as we pick back up in verse 21, right after Joseph is thrown in jail for crimes that he didn't commit, right after that has happened, we are told that the Lord is still with Joseph. Verse 21 of Genesis 39 tells us, But the Lord was with Joseph and showed him steadfast love and gave him favor in the sight of the keeper of the prison. And the keeper of the prison put Joseph in charge of all the prisoners who were in prison. Whatever was done there, he was the one who did it. The keeper of the prison paid no attention to anything that Joseph was in charge of because the Lord was with him and whatever he did, the Lord made it succeeds. So we see here this promise again in 21 and in the last verse here of Genesis 39 that we are promised again that the Lord is still with Joseph. And just like how Joseph was put in charge of all the servants of the household of Potiphar, he is now put in charge of all the prisoners. Pretty much he is the top prisoner, just like he was the top slave, the top servant in the house of Potiphar. He is going to oversee, instead of it being all the other servants and the slaves and the matters of the Potiphar's household, he is going to oversee all the prisoners. That that is Joseph's job. And the Lord, again, we see, makes it so that whatever Joseph does, he succeeds. And in the captain of the guard, this man who here who's in charge of all the prisoners, sees that Joseph succeeds, sees that something is with Joseph that's causing him to succeed. And because of this, as we know, it's the Lord. Because the Lord is with Joseph, he puts Joseph in charge of all the prisoners. So even though Joseph is facing this continued continued string of awful events that happen to him over and over and over. And right when something good seems like it's happening, another bad thing happens. Even though this awful string of events is happening to him, we can see that the Lord is still with Joseph. We can see that God is still with Joseph, which which for us, as we're reading this, means that just because bad things happen to us, just because something bad happens to you or to me, That doesn't mean that the Lord has left us. 
Just because bad things happen doesn't mean that God is gone. In, instead, it causes us to have to cling to his plan when our worldly comforts abandon us. When the things that we're putting our trust in on this earth, whether it's money or people that we love or things that we have, all those comforts of the world, when those things abandon us, it causes us to have to trust in God even more. And, and we see that just because bad things happen doesn't mean that God has left us. In fact, we see that God is promised to still be with Joseph here. And as we continue now in chapter 40, we're going to see just how Joseph responds to being wrongfully thrown in prison. Verse 1 of chapter 40 tells us, Sometime after this, sometime after Joseph has been thrown in prison and been put in charge of all the prisoners, the cupbearer of the king of Egypt and his baker committed offense against the Lord, the king of Egypt. So this cupbearer and this baker have done something that has gone against what Pharaoh wishes. They have done things that are offensive to Pharaoh. And Pharaoh was angry with his two officers, the chief cupbearer and the chief baker, and put them in custody of the house of the captain of the guard in the prison where Joseph was confined. The captain of the guard appointed Joseph to be with them, and he attended to them. They continued for some time in custody. And one night they both dreamed, the cupbearer and the baker of the king of Egypt, who were confined in prison, each of his own dream, and each dream with its own interpretation. When Joseph came to them the next morning, he saw that they were troubled. So he asked Pharaoh's officers who were with him in custody of his master's house. Why are, you fa- why are your faces downcast today? They said to him, we have, dream- we have had dreams, and there is no one to interpret them. And Joseph said to them, Do not interpretations belong to God. Please tell them to me. So we see, obviously, Joseph is put in charge of all the prisoners, and specifically these prisoners who have just done things that are offensive to Pharaoh. And we see that they are put in prison, and one night, as Joseph is in charge of them, they go to sleep, and each of them have dreams. They have individual dreams. And then the next morning when Joseph comes to check on them, when he comes to see how they're doing as he's the overseer of the prisoners, he sees that they are, as our Bible tells us, that they are downcast, that the cupbearer is downcast, and that the baker is downcast. We see that they are upset. He, he says to them, what's wrong with you? Why are you downcast? Why are you sad? What is wrong? wrong with you what's wrong how can i help how can i joseph help we see that's the heart that he comes to them the the, these two people who are brought in prison that he is overseeing a cupbearer whose job would have been to taste everything that is brought to pharaoh and that if the cupbearer then lives after tasting the food and the the drink brought to pharaoh then that meant it was safe for pharaoh to eat and drink it and if the cupbearer died after tasting it, that would mean that it was not safe and was poisoned. That would be his job. And the baker, whose job obviously is to bake things for Pharaoh, to provide this food, that these people are brought. They committed offenses against Pharaoh. And while we do not know what they did, we see that they are here in prison. And Joseph comes to them the next morning after their dream, seeking to figure out why they are upset. We see here a great reminder that no matter what our circumstances are, no matter how awful or how great they are, no matter how high or how low we feel, that we can't sacrifice God's command to love our neighbors and to show the love of Christ to others, even though we may feel like we've been slighted. That regardless of our situation, we are commanded to love those around us. And Joseph displays this here. He could have said, you know what? My life isn't going well. You know what? People have wronged me. Both my brothers and Potiphar and everybody involved has wronged me. I just don't feel like loving other people. I'm going to be rude. I'm going to look out for me and I'm going to make sure that I'm protected. I don't care about what happens to other people. He could have easily done that. I'm sure that some of you have probably faced that situation when you felt like you've been wronged and instead of doing the right thing, have turned and done the selfish thing. I'm sure most of us have. But here we see this great display from Joseph here that we are to continue to love and show the kindness of God to everyone that we come into contact with, regardless of our situation. 
that this is an awesome reminder that we see from Joseph to love one another regardless of what life is throwing at us. But then in verse 8, the, the men respond with their dreams, that they had had these dreams, and that no one is there to interpret them. They're sad because they had these really confusing dreams, and there's nobody to tell them what these dreams mean. And Joseph gives us this beautiful, this amazing response here when he says, Do not interpretations belong to God. Please tell them to me. By saying this, he's doing a couple of things. By saying, do, do not these interpretations belong to God. He's going against the Egyptian belief here that obviously we are in Egypt. Joseph is in Egypt. He goes against the Egyptian belief that dream interpretation was something that you or that the Egyptian would practice. That you would practice at getting better at dream interpretation. That it was a skill to be learned that it was up to what you did, and also that it was impacted by the many gods that they worshipped, by the many lowercase g gods and idols that they worshipped. They viewed this dream interpretation as something that you would be either skilled in or not skilled in to do, and that all of this glory, fame, and credit goes to you if you're able to interpret it. They had dream interpreters who practiced for years, practicing trying to pick up the skill of dream interpretation, that they would go to dream interpretation college and try to figure out and study dream interpretation, that they believed that it was up to man to get the credit or not for how we interpreted, for how they interpreted dreams. And by saying this, by saying, does not this belong to God, Joseph is letting both the people that he's specifically talking to here, the cupbearer and the baker and everybody in the prison know that A, I don't believe that it is a thing that man can practice, that the credit goes to man. I don't believe that it comes from your Egyptian gods, but it comes from God and from God alone. The interpretation comes from God and it doesn't come from what I am able to do as a human. Joseph begins by taking the glory that Egyptian men and women would try to give to themselves. He takes that, and instead of himself saying, well, I can do it because I'm skilled in it, because I am great at this, give me the credit. Instead of saying that, he says this interpretation, this getting this interpretation right, the being able to get your dream interpreted correctly doesn't come from me. It doesn't come from what I'm about to say. Don't give me the credit. But it comes from God and from God alone. That all this glory, honor, and praise comes from the God that Joseph serves, Yahweh, the Lord his God. That all of this credit goes directly to God instead of it being mistakenly given to sinful, broken man. That Joseph immediately gives the glory to God. God. And we see that he doesn't just give God the credit here alone, but he also does it later, as we're going to read next week in chapter 41, in front of Pharaoh. He again, in 41.16, says, Joseph answered Pharaoh, it is not in me. God will give Pharaoh a favorable answer. That when he's presented before Pharaoh, the person who's in charge of all of Egypt, his answer doesn't change. He doesn't say, well, I guess I'm in a situation now where I could uh, benefit from saying, yeah, this is, this is me. This is, this is all me. Give me the credit. His answer stays the same by giving all the credit, honor, praise, and glory to his God and to his God alone, to the God whom he worships. Over and over, Joseph makes it clear to everyone around him that everything all this glory, honor, praise, and credit when it comes to this dream interpretation goes to God and to God alone. And point one for you today, what you need to learn from Joseph at Joseph's action here, what Joseph says here when it comes to this dream interpretation, point number one for you today is that you need to seek to give God the credit every time. Seek to give God the credit every time. And no, I'm not talking about dream interpretation right now because we don't 
do that. I, I, none of us are practicing that right now. None of us have the need for that right now. I'm specifically talking about us giving God the credit for everything that he does in your life, whether big or small. Because everything you do, whatever you succeed in, wherever you see good things happen, whether it has to do with your job one day or success on a test or whatever it is, great, good, or small things that happen to you that you could take credit for, all of these things are given to you by God. They're not earned by you. The glory, the credit, the praise, the honor doesn't go to you, but it goes to to God. All of this was given to you by God, and you wouldn't be able to do any of these things without His perfect plan having been laid out first. Without the creator of the universe creating you and setting forth this plan He has for your life. All the glory has to go to God. Seek to give God His credit and His glory every step of the way. God deserves it and we need to give it to him. Think about it. I, I'm sure that all of you have been at some point part of a group project where you've had three or four people in your group and there's just that one person who clearly is not going to do any of the work and the rest of your group has to pick up the slack and do the extra work and make sure the PowerPoint gets done and make sure the video's done and all the notes are done because this one person clearly isn't going to do any of the work and you and the rest of your group has to pick up the slack for what this person didn't do. Who knows, maybe sometimes this has been you. Maybe you're sitting there thinking, uh, yeah, I've done that a couple times. How does that make you feel when you have somebody in your group project not doing any of the work and then taking credit for the grade that you've gotten where they get the same grade as you because you were in the same group you both get the A even though you put in all this work and they put in none how does that make you right here feel how do you feel when that happens angry jealous like what happened was unfair and that person doesn't deserve what they got Maybe you told the teacher, maybe you let it go, whatever it was. I'm sure that you have felt that feeling before. However you responded, you knew that that person didn't deserve the credit that they got. And it wasn't right. That they aren't, get, that they aren't getting what they really deserve, which is a zero, because they did none of the work. And this is what it's like when we try to take credit for what God has done. For what the God of the universe, the God who is over all, who's the creator of everything, whose plan is perfect and set out, when we try to take credit for what he has done. Well, while we're sitting there taking credit for this thing that we did, we are forgetting that it is all only possible because of God and because of God alone. Not because of what I did, but because of what God did has done. When we say, look at what I did and look at how great I am and the things that I have done in my accomplishments and all these things that have happened to me, we are taking credit from what God has done. We are taking or we're trying to take credit from God. You need to resolve today to give God the credit every step of the way in your life. Don't seek to be selfish and take the credit or try to take the credit for yourself. Instead, resolve to give that credit to God. Just like Joseph does here before he even interprets the dream, which the interpretation obviously comes from God, he says interpretation comes from God and from God alone. He doesn't take any of the credit and he continually doesn't take credit as he continues to interpret these dreams. So, so the scene has been set that Joseph has set this scene for these two men by saying, interpretation comes from God, tell me your dreams. So now we see what dreams these two men had and the interpretation for what is going to happen to them in three short days. The cupbearer begins in verse 9 by saying, so the chief cupbearer told his dream to Joseph and said to him, 
In my dream there was a vine before me, and on the vine there were three branches, and as soon as it budded, it blossomed, shot forth, and the clusters ripened in the grapes. Pharaoh's cup was in my hand, and I took the grapes, presented them into Pharaoh's cup, pressed them into Pharaoh's cup, and placed the cup in Pharaoh's hand. So we see here that the cupbearer has this dream that three branches are placed before him, the branches grow grapes, and he presses the grapes into Pharaoh's cup and gives the cup to Pharaoh. And Joseph gives him the interpretation saying, this is its interpretation. The three branches are three days. So in three days, this is going to happen to you. In three days, Pharaoh will lift up your head and restore you to your office and you shall place Pharaoh's cup in his hand as formerly when you were his cupbearer. So Joseph says in three days, because there were three branches, you are going to be lifted up. You are going to be restored to the position that you had held in the past. You will be the cupbearer again, and there aren't more consequences coming for you. In three days, Pharaoh's going to restore you to your position. That's the interpretation. That's what Joseph says. That's what Joseph says is going to happen. The interpretation coming from God, not from Joseph himself. Then Joseph responds by telling him this interpretation comes from God. That this interpretation comes from God, not from man. In three days, this is going to happen. So Joseph gives the cupbearer these good news that not more bad is coming to you, that this persecution is about to be over, that you're not facing more judgment, but in reality, you're going to be restored. So Joseph gives him this good news that his dream brings restoration and responds to him by saying, only remember me. Joseph says to the cupbearer, I only ask this of you. Only remember me when it is well with you, and please do me the kindness to mention me to Pharaoh, and so get me out of this house. Joseph asks him, he says to him, when you are restored, when you are back to your position, being in favor of Pharaoh again, I only ask that you would remember me so that I can be brought out of prison for what has wrongfully been accused of me, what I never did. And, and Joseph continues by saying in verse 15, giving reference back to what has already happened to him. In verse 15, he says, For I was indeed stolen out of the land of of the Hebrews. And here also I have done nothing that should put me into the pit. This obviously is a reference to him back in the land of the Hebrews, back when he was living with his family, being stolen out of the land of the Hebrews and sold to sold by his brothers to this group of slave traders and being brought to Egypt, sold as a slave to Potiphar. This is obviously a reference to that, that he was once thrown into a pit by his brothers while they considered what they were going to do with him, eventually selling him into slavery, even though he had done nothing wrong, and that during his time here in Egypt, he had done nothing wrong and still was again thrown into prison, or as he says here, into a pit that he is in now. A reference back to what has happened to him, formally being wrongfully brought out of his homeland, sold as a slave, thrown into a pit in his homeland, and thrown into a pit again. This is obviously a reference to what has happened back then and has happened now. Him feeling like, I've been wrongfully thrown into a pit. And Joseph sees this as his opportunity to get out. He sees this, that this man, this cupbearer, is going to be restored as his opportunity to get out from what he was wrongfully accused of. And he pleads the cupbearer to not forget him, but to help him get out of prison. But unfortunately, we're going to see that the second that this man is restored, he immediately forgets Joseph, and he forgets him for two full years. But as we're thinking about what Joseph says here in verses 14 and 15, as we're thinking about his request for the cupbearer and his recollection of what has happened to him in the past and what has happened to him wrongfully now, we need to think to ourselves... How do I, how do you respond when you feel like you've been wronged? Because here, as we're reading in verse 14 and 15, we see that Joseph is obviously very clear that these things that have happened to me are not right. I have been wronged by my brothers. I've been wronged by these Egyptians. I've been wronged by Potiphar. I've been wronged by these people involved. And I have paid the price for their sin, for the wrong things that have been done to me. And the question that we have for ourselves is, how do you 
respond when you feel like you've been wronged? Do you tend to do something like blame God? To say, God, this is your fault? Do you try to fix the problem on your own? To say, you know what? This is time for my plan to kick in. I'm going to be the leader here. Do you try to get revenge on the person who's wronged you? By saying, they hurt me, I'm going to hurt them. That's just being even. Do you spend all your time complaining to your parents or to your friends? Talking about people behind their backs saying, I can't believe that so-and-so would do this thing to me. How dare they? I'm going to complain about them and make fun of them. Do you run away from your problem? Do you say, you know what? Peace. I'm out. I'm gone. I'm not going to deal with this anymore. Restoration and forgiveness, not a thing. I'm out, not dealing with it anymore. Is that how you respond to when people wrong you, when wrong things happen to you? Or do you trust God knowing that trials are promised, like we've gone through in James 1, that trials are coming, that they are happening to you, that they are going to happen, that they're promised? And knowing that our response to them can either create a growth in our faith or can reveal our spiritual immaturity. Are you seeking to pursue reconciliation and forgiveness rather than selfishness and revenge? What do you, sitting on the couch, what do you do when you feel like you've been wronged? We see what Joseph does. We see that Joseph continues to trust in God, telling everyone that he can everyone around him who can hear him that everything that has happened to him both good and bad happens is coming from God and from God alone that whatever man has meant for evil God uses for good that Joseph continues to give glory honor praise and the credit to God trusting in him while bad things are going on around him still able to say I'm trusting in God This comes from God, and God alone should be glorified for it. But what will you do? That's our question. That's my question for you today. When you're playing the waiting game, when you feel like you've been wronged, when you feel like wrong things, sinful things have happened to you, what will you do? Point number two, identify what you turn to when you are wronged. Identify what you turn to when you are wronged. You personally right now need to figure out what you turn to. Is it one of those things that I listed earlier, maybe blaming God, complaining, trying to get revenge on whoever has wronged you? Is it selfishness, revenge, anger, annoyance, pettiness, complaining, profanity, whatever it is, identify it today and sub point being our point that's under point number two, our sub point being, Obviously, it's identify what you turn to when you're wronged. But our, our sub point being, our implication here, our application for once you identify what it is that you sinfully turn to and replace it with trust in Christ. Replace it with trust in Christ. Identify what you sinfully turn to, what your flesh cries out to have you to turn to, and replace it with your trust in Christ and in Christ alone. Because right now you're at a stage in your life that is easy. It's as easy as it's going to get. And the way you respond to situations right now, if not fixed, if not replaced with trust and love in Christ, seeking to love those around you, not get revenge, if you don't replace that now, it will only balloon into something much bigger as you get older and your problems become more significant. Right now, it's much easier for you to change your bad habits, those sinful things that you want to turn to when you feel like somebody's wronged you. It's going to be much easier right now to change those bad habits to 20 years from now, when you guys are in your 30s, to realize those bad habits that have taken root and have to try to change the things that you are stuck in your way. It's going to be much easier, trust me, to change those now, to identify them, kill them, and replace them with our trust in Christ rather than to wait down the road when you are stuck in your ways. Are you willing to do that? Are you willing to get a chance to talk with your leaders as we are going to go to Zoom after this? Are you willing to identify those things with your leaders, with your parents, with me, 
and change those, kill those, and replace it with trust in Christ. So even right now, as you're writing down this point and jotting down the sub point, and, uh, taking notes, I would love for you to take this time also to jot down some of those things that you know that your flesh, that your sinful self is more willing or is more likely to return to. The things that you honestly know that you turn to when you face a situation where somebody has wronged you, when something bad has happened to you that you don't deserve. And as we continue, we see that the baker in verse 16 here, after good news has happened to the cupbearer, that the baker gets eager because he sees that good news happens to the cupbearer, and he thinks, well, good news here, time for me to come in, because I'm eager, I've seen good happen here, hopefully good happens for me. He eagerly asks Joseph and says, tell me about my dream. In verse 16, he says, When the chief baker saw that the interpretation was favorable, he said to Joseph, I also had a dream. There were three cake baskets on my head. The uppermost baskets, there were all sorts of baked food for Pharaoh, but the birds were eating it out of my basket on my head. So we see here that the, the baker has a dream where he has three baskets on his head that he's baked bread and these baked goods for Pharaoh. But unfortunately, as he's taking them, as he's carrying them, the birds are eating them. And we're going to see that the interpretation here of the dream that the baker has is a lot different and not favorable compared to the cupbearer. We see that Joseph answers and says in verse 18 that this is the interpretation. The three baskets are three days. So just like the branches were three days for the cupbearer, three days again in reference to the baskets. He says, these baskets are three days. In three days, Pharaoh will lift up your head from you. So while the cupbearer's head is lifted up and he's restored, we see here that verse 19 tells us his head is going to be lifted up and you are going to be hanged on a tree. And we see here that instead of being restored, instead of his head being lifted up and restored to his former position, he is indeed punished from, he's punished for his former actions, for his offenses. He loses his life. The baker, unfortunately, loses his life and is punished for his actions that he is going to be punished by Pharaoh and indeed is going to lose his life as we see in verse 19. Not the result the baker was hoping for. He was very eager to ask about his dream because he saw that good things happened to the cupbearer. A good interpretation happened, but not the same is true for the baker. We see then, indeed, Joseph's interpretations are correct as we continue in verse 20, which says on the third day, so three days, Joseph's right, or God is right in his interpretation. On the third day, which was Pharaoh's birthday, he made a feast for all of his servants and lifted up the head of the chief cupbearer and the head of the chief baker among his servants. He restored the chief cupbearer to his, posi who, to his position and placed the cup in Pharaoh's hand, but he hanged the chief baker as Joseph had interpreted to them. Yes, yet the chief, chief cupbearer did not remember Joseph, but forgot him. So we see here Joseph's interpretation or God's interpretation of these dreams is in fact correct. The cupbearer is restored, the baker loses his life, but unfortunately, as he asked in verse 14 and 15, please remember me, for this has been wrong. These things have wrongfully been done to me. Sadly, Joseph is forgotten in verse 23. Yet the chief cupbearer did not remember Joseph, but forgot him. Unfortunately, he did not get remembered so quickly. Unfortunately, the chief cupbearer forgets Joseph here. Unfortunately for Joseph. But as we continue in chapter 41, we're going to see that God's word says, after two years, two years later after this happens, after the baker is hanged and the chief cupbearer is restored, and Joseph has had this conversation with the chief cupbearer two years earlier, Two years from now, as we're going to see next week, Pharaoh has a dream where things happen. And all the people that have practiced trying to interpret dreams fail. And nobody can figure out what Pharaoh's dreams mean, why they're important. No one's able to interpret them. 
And two years after this event occurs in chapter 40, the cupbearer remembers. He remembers the man who interpreted his dream correctly and goes to Pharaoh and says, Hey, Pharaoh, there's this guy named Joseph who can interpret your dream because he interpreted my dream. And we're going to see next week that Joseph again gives glory to God and says, God has done this, not me. But after two years is what we're left off this week. Joseph is stuck in prison for two more years for things that have been wrongfully done to him. As he's helped these people, even though things have been wrongfully done to him, Joseph is stuck for two years. Joseph has to play the waiting game for two whole years in prison for things that he hasn't done. This is not a short time. This is longer than having to wait for the grade on a Spanish test or being stuck in our houses for a couple months because of the coronavirus. He had to wait not knowing how this resolution was going to happen, what was going to happen to his life, but it was coming. It is coming. He, we see here in chapter 41. He doesn't waver in his trust in the Lord because as we will see next week, again, he gives credit to God. We are promised over and over that God is with Joseph and Joseph continues to glorify God, giving him all the credit and all the praise, not taking any for his own. Point three today, as we consider the fact that this event happened, that Joseph's restoration happens two years after his conversation with the cupbearer and the baker, two full years before Joseph is freed, point three for you today, as we consider this long period of the waiting game that Joseph has to face, trust in God's plan, even if you do not know what it is. Trust in God's plan, even if you don't know what it is. Trust in God's plan, even if you don't know what it is. In the instant gratification world that we live in today, where if I want something, I can press one button, clicking it on Amazon, adding it to my cart, and sending it to my house, and getting it two days later. In this world that we live in, where if I want something, I want it now, and I get it now, we need to, as Christians, realize that just because I can't immediately see God's plan, just because I don't immediately know what God is doing in my life, what His plan entails, doesn't mean that His plan still isn't working out. That two-year period that Joseph faced, just because the cupbearer forgot him, didn't mean that God wasn't still at work in Joseph's life, that God's perfect plan wasn't still going to come to fruition. It just meant that Joseph had to trust in the Lord as these earthly comforts had left him, that he had to trust in God. It It may take time for you to realize the plan that God has set out for you. It may take weeks, it may take months, it may take years as we see for Joseph. It may take seasons of life. For Joseph, it takes two years. But that doesn't mean that God's plan isn't still at work. We see that it, in fact, absolutely is for Joseph and it is for you and for I. And if you're sitting there using the mindset that our world uses, that is, I want it, I see it, I got it, that it's that, I see it, I want it, I got it. If you're living by that mindset, then you're going to be very disappointed when you have to play the waiting game because sometimes God's plan requires patience from you and from me. There isn't always an instant answer as we see here from Joseph. But as we continue through this story in Genesis, we see that that isn't because God isn't at work. It's because God is having Joseph trust in his plan, that God indeed is still in work, that, God in, that God's plan is still working out, just because we don't know what it is and just because we have to wait doesn't mean that it's not there. It's the opposite. God is always at work and we can absolutely trust in that. When your plan doesn't work out, you need to be committed to trusting in God's plan, even if you have no idea how God's plan is going to be resolved. Joseph had to because he was sitting in prison with no hope in anything other than in God and in God alone. His family had abandoned him. The people he worked for had abandoned him. The people he helped had abandoned him. He was alone in prison and could only trust in God and in God's plan. 
And two years from now, we see that God's plan is brought to fruition and Joseph is restored. And he continues to trust in the Lord regardless of what happens, regardless of how long it takes. And I think we all need to remember today, we all need this reminder today, realizing the significant time it took for God's plan to come to fruition, to Joseph, for Joseph to see what was happening. God knew from day one that this was going to happen to Joseph. God wasn't confused. God wasn't worried. God wasn't anxious. This plan was coming to fruition in the perfect time. Joseph just couldn't see it. Joseph just didn't know how it was going to happen. So we need to realize this, this length of time, because I don't want you and I to become impatient when we have to trust in God's plan so that we are prepared to trust in God and play the waiting game that we've talked about at the start and all the way through to play the waiting game for as long as it takes. Not blaming anyone or anything, but letting times where we have to wait strengthen our trust in God. That this waiting game means that I don't, I'm not worried that God's plan isn't going to come to fruition, but that I'm waiting for it to happen. I trust in the fact that God The God of the universe has a perfect plan for me and for you, and that plan is going to come to fruition. And that we can trust in that today, whether it takes a day, a month, or two years, as we see that happens to Joseph. Not blaming anybody, but strengthening our trust in the Lord. So as we close here, as our final point that we've discussed already, how we need to, regardless the amount of time, continue to trust in God's plan. And just because we can't see God's plan doesn't mean that it's not there. As we close, you need to decide on your own right now, am I, are you, are you ready to trust God's plan? Right now, as you're stuck at home and nervous about what's going on with COVID-19, as you're wondering what's happening, as you are stuck playing the waiting game, Am I going to trust God or am I going to become impatient and blame God? Am I going to trust in his perfect plan regardless of how long this takes or am I going to blame God? Am I going to be impatient? What are you going to do? Because I don't want you to base your trust, the fact that you trust God. I don't want you to base your trust in God on the severity of your problems. That if your problem is down here, That if it's lower, that you're going to trust God. But if it gets up here and it's really high, that that's the time for me to take over and say, Jesus, I'm taking the wheel. It's my turn. This is too serious for me to trust in something else. That's not what I want you to do. I don't want you to place your trust in God based on how severe or how light a problem is, but to commit yourself today to trusting in God's plan, to trusting in God, regardless of the severity of the situation, around you, regardless of how long you have to play the waiting game. You need to resolve today that you are willing to trust in God's plan, however long it may take to come to fruition. However long it may take to come to fruition. Seeking it as an opportunity to grow instead of complaining and becoming angry and blaming other people. As we continue this story, as we continue through the narrative of Joseph, we are going to see that Joseph's trust in the Lord is rewarded as he is used to save not only the whole nation of Egypt, but to save his family in the Abrahamic covenant. That God is going to build a nation through Abraham, and Joseph plays a role in that. He didn't abandon his trust in God during these two years. He still trusts in God. And we don't want you, I don't want you to abandon your trust in God, regardless of what is going on in your life. Because no matter how big or how small something is, no no matter how big or severe it feels, we can still say that we trust in God and we are willing to play the waiting game because we know that the God of the universe is still in control and His plan is perfect, just like Joseph was able to say. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for the ability to come back to your word this week and glorify you. God, we ask that you, O Lord, would be with us right now as we're practicing another week of social distancing. Lord, that as we are in situations where we have to play the waiting game, that we would trust in you and in you alone rather than in our circumstances. Father God, rather than in ourselves. God, that you would allow us to respond in trust to you when we have to wait and 
not know what's going on. Father God, that we would give all the glory of everything that you do, that we would give all that glory, all the good things that happen to us directly to you and not try to take any credit from you. Lord, and that when we feel wronged, God, that we would respond in love, kindness, and trust in you rather than seeking to sinfully seek revenge, Father God. We pray that we would trust in you regardless of how long we have to, God. No matter how long any situation in our life lasts, that we would continue to trust in you just like Joseph did when he was in prison for two years. Lord, let us take these applications that we learned from your word today in the book of Genesis and apply them to our lives and go to group now and discuss those with our leaders. Lord, we thank you for another week of being in your word and how you are faithful all times. Lord, we thank you, Lord, and we pray. Amen. That's all I have for you guys today. Thank you so much for joining us for another Wednesday night. Now's the time for you to head off to small groups. Don't forget, small groups will be done by 8 o'clock, no later than 8. So you guys can also head to tonight's Time in Psalms and worship with Pastor Ben. I will see you guys Friday. Don't forget to join our Friday night prayer group starting at 7 o'clock. I hope you guys have a great week. Hope to hear from you soon. Bye.